Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ismail Sragildin. I'm director of the Library of Alexandria, and allow me to welcome you all here today. On behalf of Her Excellency, the First Lady, Suzanne Mubarak, who is also the chair of the board of the Library of Alexandria, who is planning to be with us today. However, she just called me. She has been unavoidably detained, and she asked me to deliver on her behalf the comments that she had prepared for this conference that she was planning to give. So those of you who know the First Lady have to imagine the elegance and the beauty that she is famous for instead of me. But these are her words anyway. They're not my words, these are her words. So, so Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to Egypt and welcome to Alexandria. Welcome to the International Conference on Evaluating Climate Change and Development. We are gathered here in the new Biblioteca Alexandrina, heir to the ancient library of Alexandria, a place intended to be a forum for international talent to address issues of importance to the world. By providing a forum for such gatherings, the library reminds us of our common humanity and our common destiny on this planet. The talent gathered here from the four corners of the globe is quite impressive. We will need all the experience that you possess, all the knowledge that you have mastered, and all the wisdom that you can deploy in order to address the greatest issues facing the global environment today as we continue to pursue unsustainable development patterns and as the specter of devastation induced by climate change hovers over us. Our development patterns are unsustainable and grossly unfair. Consider the paradox of our times. We live in a world of plenty, of dazzling scientific advances and technological breakthroughs. Adventures in cyberspace are at hand. Yet, our times are marred by conflict, violence, economic uncertainties, and tragic poverty. Globalization grows, fueled by the integration of the world economies, a revolution in computers, telecommunications, and the non-stop activities of capital markets that transact over $2.4 trillion a day, enough to buy and sell the whole GNP of the United States in a week. Equally global, however, are the increasing inequities between societies and within societies. A generation ago, the top 20% was 30 times as rich as the bottom 20%. Today, they are 80 times as rich. And poverty is a global phenomenon. There are rich people in poor countries and poor people in rich countries. But poverty remains enormously more pervasive and acute in the South. In the 47 least developed countries of the world, 10% of the world's population subsists on less than one half of 1% of the world's income. And some 40,000 people die from hunger-related causes every day. Over a billion people are compelled to live on less than a dollar a day. And despite the increases in income in places like China and the improvements of diets recorded there, hunger and malnutrition are everywhere. The current maddening increase in food prices is pushing hundreds of millions of the poor and the destitute into chronic malnourishment and hunger. And in the face of such a challenge, the rich subsidize the transformation of food into biofuels, subsidizing burning the food of the poor to drive the cars of the rich. The scourge of AIDS is devastating entire populations. Chronic diseases like malaria and bilharzia continue to claim countless lives and debilitate millions of people. Meanwhile, the big pharmaceutical companies are focusing on the medicines of the rich and ignoring the needs of the poor. Efforts to address these needs rely on charities and the UN agencies as their primary support. Our environment and ecosystems are under siege. The marine fisheries of the world are grossly overexploited. 
The soils are rapidly eroding in many parts of the planet. Water is becoming scarcer as underground aquifers are drawn down faster than their natural recharge rate. And pollution reduces the usability of the available fresh water. Deforestation is still continuing at the rate of some 25 million hectares per year. And the global challenges of desertification and loss of biodiversity demand redoubled efforts. Women tend to suffer the most from these problems. They are the custodians of the environment and its victims. They fetch the water, cook the meals, cope with the impact of unsanitary conditions on their children, and usually grow the crops that feed the family. The more precarious living conditions inevitably challenge them first. And we must therefore redouble our efforts at educating girls and empowering women, for they are on the front lines of confronting the new problems created by environmental degradation, and they will be the vanguard in adopting new approaches to sustainability. To that global stock of environmental problems, we're adding a flow of new challenges due to population growth that is averaging 90 million persons per year, mostly in the poorest countries. They will need more food, more land, and more water. Against this backdrop, attention to climate change takes on an even more pressing urgency. Climate change will devastate the developing world. It will shorten the growing seasons for agriculture, bring about more uncertain rainfall, and alternate floods and droughts on those who can least afford to cope with such challenges. The melting of the Arctic ice may be no more than a decade away, and the potential catastrophe of rising sea levels requires urgent action to mitigate its effects, if not to entirely reverse these trends. In short, it is a time of global crisis where imaginative leadership is required, where experts have to go beyond the many small partial analyses and start working on proposals that will reverse current trends, not merely propose a band-aid when radical surgery is required. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as I look around this room, it is clear that you have assembled some of the most experienced people in the world. You have especially gathered experts who have labored long and hard at evaluating past errors and successes. We need such insights, for the lessons of the past must guide the designs for the future. You have identified talent and expertise in many disciplines, and that is all to the good. For the nature of the challenges, as I have described them, are not circumscribed by any one specialty. The analytical inputs of many disciplines will be required to craft an effective, broad-based program of action to counter the many interlinked challenges. A new energy policy, a new approach to agriculture and water use, new industries, a new vision for the cities of the future, and the new concept of our relationship to the ecosystems on which we and all other species depend must all permeate the new thinking. It is not enough to talk of minor savings here and there, nor is it enough to postpone actions indefinitely as study after study continues to refine the already dire predictions we have all heard many times over. A new broad-based approach to promote sustainable development is needed. That, in turn, will require the commitment and efforts of many actors to make it work. Government, private sector, and non-government organizations will all have to work together at the local, national, regional, and international levels if we are to achieve the desired results. I sincerely hope that your deliberations will yield such recommendations to all the actors who must be involved if humanity is to rise to the challenge of climate change and sustainable development in the 21st century. Actually, we have already shown that all of us, the scientific experts, the international community, governments, the private sector, and the NGOs, can collaborate to make a difference in addressing global environmental challenges. One of the signal achievements of the last century 
was the Montreal Protocol for the Ozone. Egyptians played a special role in that agreement and its implementation, as well as in the creation of the Global Environment Facility. Dr. Mustafa Tolba, then Director General of UNEP, Omar El Arini, head of the fund of the Montreal Protocol, Mohammed El Ashri, founding CEO of the Global Environment Facility, and Ismail Saragiddin, then Vice President for Environmental and Socially Sustainable Development at the World Bank. I'm delighted to see that some of them are here with us today. We must draw strength and inspiration from past achievements, just as we confront present shortcomings. What was done once must be done again. The Kyoto Protocol, imperfect as it may have been, was a major step forward. It is not a time for finger pointing and recriminations. It is a time for visionary thinking and forward planning. Now we must go beyond Kyoto and devise a response that will, like the Montreal Protocol, succeed in engaging the world and in reversing the trends that have led us to where we are. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the time for action is at hand. Youth demands from us that we take seriously the responsibilities of managing this planet. For as it has been wisely noted, we did not inherit this earth from our parents, we borrowed it from our children. I wish you a very successful conference. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of Her Excellency, the First Lady, Suzanne Mubarak. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce another charming, talented lady who is at the helm of our enterprise. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask you to join me in welcoming Mrs. Monique Barbu, the CEO and Chair of the Global Environment Facility. Ms. Monique Good afternoon to everybody. After this very eloquent speech, I don't know whether we can speak more, but um, I will try uh, in my own way to say a few words to open this uh, big conference. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I want first to extend my warm thanks to our host and the International Steering Committee for organizing this important event and invited me to speak to you. I would like also to take this occasion to commend Egypt for its effort to look at the potential effect of climate change on your country, its environment and its people in all sectors of government policies and all its governance. We know that this conference is a step in this process. GF has been working since many years with Egypt, and I am happy to see that you have now decided to scale up your efforts for addressing climate change. Right now, there is much to be encouraged by. We have strong consensus among nations that now it is the time to address climate change in a more integrative way. And yet, clearly, there are still challenges to, fight, to face. Climate change mitigation is, as we know, difficult to measure, and in the case of adaptation, it is even more difficult to judge results. Not only the GF has been the world leading founder of adaptation project to date, but it has also devoted more than $2.5 billion to climate change mitigation projects, resulting in a reduction of more than 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide, equivalent in greenhouse gas emission, not including nearly 300 million tons avoided to date during the two years of our GF4 replenishment. GF has also supported projects that help ensure the resilience of biodiversity land systems, and international waters to anticipate adverse impact of climate change. It is also important to talk a bit about mitigation. In this area, this conference aims to deliver good practices 
on how to evaluate interventions. This is a much welcome step because it is critical that we better assess the impact and the cost of our past actions and learn from our mistake. That way, decision makers can support the most efficient ways forward. Evaluation has always been a tricky business. We have struggled over the years to develop tools and methodologies to measure the outcomes of our activities. We have adopted a consistent methodology for measuring greenhouse gas avoided by our energy efficiency and renewable energy interventions. And we have started working with our colleagues to develop a consistent methodology for measuring mitigation in our transport sector interventions. This information is being supplemented with other qualitative and quantitative indicators linked to targeted outcomes. While we are doing a better job of tracking our results, we still need more robust information as we look for the broader impact of climate change. Yet, I would also like to point out that the mitigation agenda itself is developing, and we may see new subjects and issues emerging which will also need evaluation. There are new insights about the role of forests and the sustainability of carbon sequestration, for example. There are also emerging linkages between the demand for biofuel and increasing food prices in the world that must be careful, carefully weighted. As oil prices reach record heights, markets may react suddenly and dramatically. My message to you is this. Please explore the future of mitigation as well and see how that could be evaluated. On the adaptation side, we have been looking closely at funding adaptation projects in coastal areas, agriculture sector, mountain ecosystem, and region facing different hydrological challenges. Our goal has been to increase the resiliency of the social and ecological system faced with global warming. Now, with the GF Secretariat operating as the Secretariat of the Adaptation Fund, we will be asked to help direct and implement the decision of that body, which will include the larger source of international funding for adaptation activities. But our understanding of adaptation requirements still need to be improved and enhanced. Resiliency is a concept that is quite difficult to measure in social, economic, and environmental terms. If our goal is to increase resiliency, the ability of systems to bounce back, we have to improve of our understanding of what this means in the many sectors in which we work. We must also work hard to improve the way we value uncertainties and the well-being of what this means in the many sectors in which we work. We must also work hard to improve the <coughs> excuse me. Uh, to improve the current methodologies which do not allow us to launch sufficiently ambitious programs to tackle climate change that can be justified from an economic standpoint. The work that we'll be presenting during this conference represents some early seminal work on the evaluation of adaptation program. At GEF, we now demand that the possible consequences of climate change are being factored in the design of each and every project that we finance. However, methodologies still need to be refined, and we hope in pragmatic terms that your deliberation can help shape 
that work into a constructive process. But beyond this, I would hope that your meetings here will help the international community clarify what it is that we want to achieve in supporting the adaptation to climate change and how, therefore, we might go about measuring and evaluating it. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we are gathered here close to one of the most important ancient founts of human knowledge. It is my hope that this stellar assembly of evaluators will be inspired by the intellectual giants on whose shoulders we stand today to reach out and put in place the next building block in the evaluation part of this journey. I thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Monique Barbu, for that challenge to the evaluators present here, and we certainly hope to rise to it. Now, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a friend and a man on whose shoulders rests the primary responsibility for dealing with the environment in Egypt. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming his Excellency, Mr. Maggid George, Egyptian Minister of State for Environmental Affairs. Excellencies, this is Malik Barbu, CEO and Chairperson of the Global Environment Facility, Dr. Ismail. Saragiddin, President of Alexandria Library, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to start by welcoming you all and to have the honor to participate in this important conference under the hospitality of the great Alexandria Library, which came out to life once more after hundreds of years of its non-existence, to become a source of light that spreads intellectual and cultural waves covering all over Egypt, the Mediterranean, and the world. Today, I am honored to convey my appreciation and gratitude for the symbol of the great achievement in Alexandria Library and the hosts of our conference, Mrs. Suzanne Mubarak, Egypt's First Lady, which with her kind, valuable support to the environment in Egypt, aspects of many environmental activities had changed, and Egypt has become one of the, leaders, of the leaders in tackling environmental problems, theoretically and practically. Today, with our country hosting this event, it is a real witness on this fact. Ladies and gentlemen, we are tackling today one of the most risky human issues, climate change, which started to have a new perspective after the IPCC fourth report that assured that climate change is a result of the increased human activities after the Industrial Revolution. This what drives most of the world countries amongst Egypt to cooperate to confront risk associated with the Earth's planet. This makes us all share our responsibility towards our future generation in what we take today from decision. It is simply shared but differentiated responsibility. There is no doubt that climate change phenomena with the increase in the greenhouse gases is due to human activities. This had led the international community to ratify the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change in 1992. Egypt had been one of the first Arab countries to ratify the Convention in 94, and the Kyoto Protocol has been derived as, po as part of this Convention, which e Egypt started its implementation by the end of February 2005. As the Egyptian government had believed in the importance of the participation of the international community 
in confronting the impacts of climate change and to make the best use of the available investment opportunities and technology transfer, a National Steering Committee for Climate Change had been established, as well as designated National Authority for CDM with the membership of relevant national entities in Egypt. We had prepared list of CDM project and in less than two years, the number of projects reached 36 with a total investment cost of $1 billion and of total 6.5 million tons of CO2 reduction. It is Egypt's contribution in reducing the phenomena of global warming worldwide. These implemented projects cover different sectors, such as energy efficiency, use of clean energy, where new and renewable energy, as wind farms and solar energy, are on the top. Other projects include the use of natural gas, solid waste, and afforestation. We have also established a GEF National Steering Committee that coordinates the projects of the multilateral environmental agreements, especially REO, those that the GEF supports. The GEF Committee considers that it is highly important to link these global environment benefits generated by the GEF projects with our national priorities. From that perspective and in coordination with GEF, we will start preparing a national energy efficiency program that will utilize the country's allocation under the area of the climate change. A 10.5 million US dollars that will leverage more funds to reach a minimum 30 million US dollars, this project will be implemented in cooperation with other line ministers and as a follow-up to the policies adopted by the Supreme Council of Energy. The developing countries, among which is Egypt, are considered the most vulnerable to the negative impact of climate change, although they are fully, not fully, responsible for this phenomena. Egypt's contribution to the greenhouse gases emission doesn't exceed 0.56% of the global emissions. This will affect different aspects of our life and the comprehensive development plans, wherever, whether from agricultural productivity of water resources or biodiversity, in addition to the threat to the sea level rise, which is on the top of those risks. Ladies and gentlemen, the role played by Jeff as a financial mechanism for implementing the obligations of the multilateral environmental agreements is crucial and vital, especially with the UNFCC. Nevertheless, and since the establishment of the Jeff in 91, it has been assisting the developing countries in protecting their global environment and providing support for projects in biodiversity climate change, international water, land degradation, and the ozone depletion, and POPs. This all lies within the framework of supporting sustainable, sustainable livelihoods of local communities. Egypt is currently a member in the Jeff Council, heading North Africa constituency. Also, Egypt is representing, is representing Africa as an alternate member in the Adaptation Fund that is managed by the GEF, where we will try through this position to convey the priorities of the African developing countries. The world countries had agreed in the latest climate change conference of parties in Bali to conduct negotiations between participating countries to, inc to include issues of mitigation, adaptation, technology cooperation, and the funding scenarios. This would lead to a development of comprehensive framework between the developed and the developing countries in implementation of environmentally friendly and low carbon projects, as well as encouraging investment within this direction. At the same time, it is essential to collaborate all Egyptian national efforts with experts, universities, and the specialized research centers, private sector, NGOs, to fully study 
all aspects of the sequences, consequences of this phenomena and its impact on all development plans and the po uh, possible options so as to achieve the required sustainable development. Ladies and gentlemen, by the end of my speech, I would like to stress the fact that we are working hard towards cooperating with all countries and the Global Environment Facility, Jeff, for a better future and a sustainable development, hoping that the developed countries would assume its responsibilities and fulfill its obligations through a collective efforts to confront climate change. At last, special thanks to Mrs. Monique Barbou, Jeff, CEO and Chairperson for attendance today, and also for all the organizers of this event, which uh, shows the Egypt status within the Jeff. Wishing you all the successful and fruitful conference. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, Mr. Megat George, Minister of State for Environmental Affairs of the Republic of Egypt. Ladies and gentlemen, the global environmental movement has had a handful of exceptional people as, if I may say, founding fathers and mothers. Uh, one may count, I suppose, uh, Rachel Carson, Gro Brundtland, Maurice Strong, but certainly, whichever way you count, you must include Mustafa Kemal Tolba. Professor Mustafa Kemal Tolba not only has had a distinguished career in Egypt, but also internationally carried the burden of making UNEP a truly powerful international agency, of negotiating the most important agreements and of putting in place the Montreal Protocol. He is, to all of us, an inspiration and a guide. And ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Mustafa Kamal Tom. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me first thank uh, Dr. Maestro Gaddin, and I always warn uh, everybody that whatever Ismail says is very biased because I've been his uh, supervisor when he was doing his PhD, so I think he takes this fully into account. Uh, uh, second, I, I think we, we all uh, miss the presence of the First Lady, and I'm sure that she was definitely more than enthusiastic uh, to come here. And uh, it is only uh, completely sudden uh, responsibilities that made her, made ourselves uh, devoid of that uh, pleasure. We really wanted the First Lady just to give a signal to the world as to where we go with climate change. I always tell the First Lady that the mere fact that she mentions something gets the ball rolling. So we're expecting her to do this, but I think Dr. Ismail Isragiddin would convey to her that uh, feeling. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think you all know that the climate change has jumped all of a sudden in the last two years to the top of our agenda. And I, I have been personally involved with the issue of climate change since 1988. That is 20 years ago, and that was the first year where uh, established with my distinguished colleague, the Secretary General of WMO, the IPCC, the famous Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was awarded the Nobel Prize for the magnificent reports that it uh, produces every six years. The latest was last November. Last November, they put it blunt, the situation, the fact that global 
warming is on us, that the temperature is increasing, and that the climate is changing is not anymore a matter of, a ma a matter of doubt. So they, they put it, whatever doubt we have, I must admit that as a scientist myself, I'm fully aware that at least three or four percent of the scientists all over the world still believe that we are going into an ice age. And we have to respect their point of view, but as, as far as I, I am concerned, as a scientist and a manager of an organization, uh, and I believe all of you, we cannot go with the possibility of the minority. We have to reckon with the views of the greatest majority of scientists in the world. Egypt, as uh, uh, the Minister, Minister of State uh, for Environment, uh, Minister Maggie George mentioned, we are producing probably less. He's saying 0.6. We are just slightly below uh, 0.6, so even adding to what we are producing. Uh, but we are considered to be one of the most vulnerable countries, he mentioned that as well, to the impacts, the negative impacts of climate change. The World Bank last year issued uh, a report saying that the, the Nile is one of the 10 rivers in the world that are going to be negatively impacted by the greenhouse gas emissions and the global warming, either a major increase in the uh, water resources coming to it or a major decrease that could uh, go up to 70% of the total. So, and then everybody spoke of the sea level rise. And uh, we have large parts of the uh, Egyptian north coast under the level, the sea level. So we are, we are prone to being drowned parts of the north uh, coast and parts of the delta, the best and most uh, productive land in Egypt, we, and the host of, uh, uh, of 10, 20, 30 million people. So we expect something like four or five million people to be uh, environmental uh, refugees because of this. Uh, we, we have all sorts of, of problems that we're expecting to face. Uh, my dear uh, friend Monique Barbeau uh, said that they want to continue with the mitigation. And she said that we have to look into the future of mitigation. But she added that adaptation is going to be the main part uh, on the agenda. Uh, definitely on our side, uh, Monique, we will continue for sure the Egyptian contribution to the international community's uh, work on mitigation. Because we have to all join hands, otherwise the whole earth will be wiped out. There's no way, nothing to adapt to, because there will be no uh, land or, or water or anything. Uh, but for a country like Egypt, as, as the minister said, producing 0.6%, we expect to have 0.6% of the impact, but we are getting 10, 15 times that much. So when you said that in the adaptation fund you put the uh, blanket, experience, uh, blanket uh, evolution, evaluation techniques, I hope we take fully into account the fact that governments or countries differ as far as the impact is uh, concerned and that priority may be given to those who are going to be the most vulnerable.